First, we were asked to present brilliant ideas for funding. Before we get the money, we're asked for the ideas. Now, the young people are thinking greatly. He's thought about a charcoal business and he's invested behind it. But yet, there is still an entry barrier. Cost is still a barrier. How do we get beyond investment for an entrepreneur? Let me start with you, Uncle Owusu Ajman. I'm, I'm, I'm only supposed to chair. <laughs> but I believe that um, the state must begin to recognize such initiatives and assist the younger generation in doing that. In America, for example, before they pull the smaller companies along, they have what they call a mental protege system, whereby, like Boeing, for example, would encourage younger people, especially the black communities and the um, the Latinos communities to produce something innovative and then they buy to construct their aircrafts. But I don't hear there's any state uh, incentive for these young people who have these brilliant ideas. And I think it's very important that we begin as a people to put down either by legislative processes or whatever we want to make sure that such initiatives are recognized. Uh, we don't really like it to go the way of porcelana, cement, and all these things. Charcoal is very important. Gas is not abundant, and we should be able to use these coconut things. And all this means that there must be a, a deliberate attempt by governmental institutions, state institutions, to help. And access to credit must be facilitated. And if even there's no uh, guarantee for it. A little bit of risk taking by the state is necessary. You have to invest in your people, but as it is, we are not investing enough in our people at all. And that's very important. It's critical. And I'm sure that if somebody has such delightful initiatives, the state should be able to assist. But as I said, I'm a technocrat. I'm not really a businessman entrepreneur, but I, maybe Chris would like to su supplement that, Chris. Chris, doctor. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about um, the conditions for getting a farm here. I, I'm told all land belongs to the chief in Ghana. Is it true? Yes. Yeah, there are people called chiefs who own all the land and you have to go and kneel down and beg for a piece. So, if you get a piece of land and you're not paying too much money for it, then what you need to know is to understand the climatic conditions of the area. Getting land in the desert doesn't help very much. You need water, you need sun, which equals heat to grow and a crop. And then you need to understand what crop you want to grow so that uh, when you go into the venture, you know exactly what you want. Then you have to study your market. Where is the demand? And what are the costs of producing, tendering, and uh, harvesting, storage? How much of it is wastage? And how do you get root to the market? How do you carry to the market? What is the perishable value? perishability of the product once you harvest it so that you a lot of African products more than a third is wasted after harvesting because of lack of storage so you just have to decide what you want to grow then once you have a, a good business plan you understand the product thoroughly then really easy. These days, by use of mobile systems, you can borrow money in two seconds. Mobile money is the way to go, and that's why I'm telling you guys, you need to adopt the mobile money business. Today, the unbackable ones in Kenya are accessing money. They can borrow, they can save, because they use the mo mobile money wallet. 
So I think I think it's the same here. The banks here equally need savers. They also need customers to sell money to. We own a bank here too. We we, we are investors in a bank called Cal Bank. Anybody here from Cal Bank? No, we 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 are we are partners with them. We we've been their partner. We made lots of money from their their, their business. Mm, mm. So I think farming, agriculture, is the right way to go. Some of you have learned from your ancestors, which is not being utilized. You get back to that land and go and farm. Don't sit in the cities and just waste your time. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Doctor, <laughs> one second. I think the issue is really how do they grow? That's the question we posed. He's given the parameters. But my concern, which I think we should add, the cost of, cap of borrowing and the various facilities that are required, even if you go into agriculture and the necessary infrastructure is not there, you have a situation whereby not only land, but inputs like if you're going to do rain-fed agriculture, which on what the French kill, peut-être, perhaps, there will be rain and there's no rain, then you are into trouble because at 35 percent, you would have run your whole family into a whole lot of debt. And I believe that there's absolute need, as I said, for proactive interventionist policies by the state to help the younger generation to access this. In Kenya, I think the um, thing may be lower. So I want him to address, uh, I mean, it, it's not that easy. And so what, how do you do it in Kenya? I would like to know. You, you know, wait. if everything was easy, everybody would be a billionaire. <laughs> it's, it's not easy. And two, you don't look just to the governments to give you money. Really, you have to fight the state situation the way it is. There is nothing easy in money making. It is tough. You have to, some countries you have agriculture financing fund, but these funds would come not from government. Government never make any money of their own. They are spenders. Government is a spender. They receive your taxes and they spend it. By end of the year, they are borrowing themselves. What happens is that some institutions outside do give some funding to support delicate areas like agriculture. But you must examine other alternatives. If you wait for government to fund you, government to fund you, you'll be wishing that wishes were horses because your auntie would ride the horse. Mm. <laughs> okay. You, you just got to get the idea out of government. Government is a spender everywhere. So find many other alternatives, like joining hands together and becoming a cooperative, a group of people, saving a little bit from each of you. That is one way to go. But if government comes in and supports you, well and done. I'm not into the political issues, whether the government is friendly or not. That is your business to deal with. For me, I have never got money from government. I borrow money in the open market. A lot of our people who waited for government to feed them, they are still waiting. Mm. Okay, um, let me, on the back of that, let me just, um, as you are preparing your questions um, to, to ask, let me just ask one question. Let me direct it to Dr. Bello um, Saji. Um, your investor was your husband, if I got you correct. So let me, let me take the, and you said you always need to have a backup plan. So in your list, in your priority, you have point number five or so was the backup plan. So if the husband venture capital was not in there, you probably would have fallen either 
on the short-term financing from the bank, long-term financing if you're lucky, or some angel investor who is willing to wait five years for an idea to seed. What would you have done? Out of those options? Yes. <laughs> I'd probably... Because it's one of the biggest problems that many entrepreneurs have. Where would you have gone? Um, I suspect I wouldn't have wanted to go to the bank. Expensive. Probably would have looked for a replacement investor, so an angel investor. But even they want their money back fairly quickly. To be honest, I suspect that my first reaction would have been to sell some of my assets, whatever I might have had that was sellable, because I wouldn't have wanted to owe a lot of people money at that time. Um, I, I think just to follow up on the various comments that were made earlier, obviously the issue for most of us is the uh, access to inexpensive financing. And of course, you know, now people are doing crowdfunding and things like that in order to try and make money available. But I think part of our problem is that uh, government not giving you money is one thing, but government policy that makes it easier for people to access money is also another thing. It, it's something we need to think about. If um, uh, you know, the, the costs of doing business are high, in a way that makes your business more difficult to do. So it's things like that that I think the government can seriously think about. They talk about giving SME financing and all of that, but there are other regulations that affect what is done. So those policies also need to be thought about a little bit. Okay. So three things now. Um, I'm going to your questions. First question. Um, Anybody? Yes, there's a question from the back. Right. Yes. My name is... No, hold on one moment. My name is Nweti Norte, and I'm a distributor for Missing Wax, or SCJ. Okay. Now, of all the personalities who have given us their view of how to run a business and be successful, I just want to ask if any of them has ever failed in this business, and what did they do to reorganize the business again? How many of you have failed? And how many times have you failed? You know, I've failed in some business. I, I owned a factory of paint, producing paints. But I hadn't studied the market properly. And uh, I just concentrated in making this quality type of paint, which was good for cleaning trees, removing uh, insects, climbing on trees. It was the in insecticide paint. But I only discovered about the market conditions later on and I found that uh, most people who bought paint were Indians. Indians did most of the construction for homes. And the only people who came to buy my paint were Indians who are not given credit by the other Indian companies or the, the, the main store suppliers. But they took my paint at the end of the construction period and they told me in 30 days, 45 days, we'll pay you. And I was very happy. Let it down very, very badly. Um, when I was away, I left to go and do a bit, uh, the, the love of my life to do politics. And I left it to a Ghanaian general manager and a Ghanaian manager. I mean, they squandered everything. So by the time it came, so this is the problem that most Ghanaian entrepreneurs are facing. And at the end of the day, it left us with a bit of, quite a bit of debt. And to you ask yourself how does it really matter? So as he said, we close it down, maybe start another one. Even in the pharmaceutical company where we did, can you imagine a whole qualified pharmacist? And you have to be fair so that you have the experiences. You ask for the experience, I'll tell you. We imported drugs, medication, and these were prime drugs from Germany. The pharmacist said he was going to sell the drugs for us. He would take the drugs to town, he comes to I didn't sell anything, not really, he would take it, and ours which were, had a long shelf life, he would give it to people, and exchange them, expired products to the pharmacy. 
and now he's supposed to be a big man in society here. And this is what it was happened. And again, I closed on the pharmacy. So this is what it is. Until we Ghanaians learn to be honest with ourselves, yet there might be controls and programs and processes, but then we end up working for foreigners, for the Lebanese, for the Indians, for the Turkish people, for everybody. Because they have the system. They bring their own people there and they are true to them. And at the end of the day, we, we, we destroy our own businesses. That was my very bitter experience. Trusting my own compatriots, doing them at the end of the day, letting them down badly. This is my, so if you want to do your experience, this, I could tell you a third and fourth one, but that's how it is. Uh, uh, we lose, and uh, you, you just close it down. I mean, at the time that we closed down the Procter and Gamble business, we had 260 employees all finished. And that was the story of my life. Interesting. Um, so if, even beyond the, um, the financing um, love that we young entrepreneurs have, there's also the work ethic. There's also a strong culture for driving the business. So I will move my next question to Nanekia. Um, I, I, I will try and do this in two ways. Um, over the past one month, I've had lots of young women come to me with ideas. And when they sense that I might not be investing lots of cash in it for them, they are quick to throw partnership to me. Okay. And I, I'm, I want to ask if you've been there before, a point where you wake up in the night and you say, maybe for me to, to kick off my business, let me just call Dr. Chris and say, you know, I will dash you 50% shares. Give me some, something small to start. Have you, did you ever get there? Okay. Um... No, uh, I, I didn't start off with any financing or anything like this. I just had a passion. I had a drive and I had a lot of hard work in me. Some of my colleagues are here. Um, then when I was even working in another office, when I, before, when I started with Imperial Homes, I would be closing from work sometimes 9, 10, get home, sleep for two hours, wake up and work literally till the next day and go to work. I did this consistently for so many months before I even started the company. And um, like I said, I didn't have a capital, but the work itself started to pay for what I was doing. And um, everyone that has worked with us, I mean, once you come to see the way we are working, you can see the efforts that is going into it. People are willing to put down money for hard work. I mean, for me, that's my, and I haven't failed at a business yet. God willing, I won't because I'm only five years in business Amen. now. <laughs> and uh, hopefully it just grows. Okay. Patrice, <laughs> do we have anybody? Thank you. My name is Catherine. I work with Stambic Bank. Um, I, I think the question is actually open to all um, um, uh, abled gentlemen and women. Uh, please, um, I would like to know, you know, in Ghana, for instance, our currency keeps depreciating. If you, for instance, intend to save to start a business, you have the um, time value of money factor to consider. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, for instance, begin by saving, say, 10% of your funds with the intention of making, a, like putting together some money to start a particular business at a particular point in time, it could get to that time and then your money is valueless. Yes. How can you manage such a situation? Thank you. <laughs> I, I thought, I, I thought when, when she said uh, in Ghana here, so I thought maybe <laughs> we would have. <laughs> Who would go for it? By the time I, you. you <laughs> I'm sure you, you are old enough to know Brazil when you bought a loaf of bread in the morning and by 4 o'clock the bread prices was completely different price. Now in Africa the most important thing is stability of currency. You work for the bank, you understand it. Currency uh, Mobility is a very key thing in building stable economic development. 
And that is where your central bank, your government spending comes in. There was a time Ghanaian CD was, uh, I think, almost one to one with the dollar, wasn't it? Yeah. My days when I was in charge of your economy, it was about that. Today, I think it's three and a half or four. Yeah. Eh? Well, it's, it's about four in the, in the banking sector. In the black market, it's about five or six. Currency devaluation is a very serious thing. And that's why in an economy, government has to sustain an economy that people can trust, an economy that makes sure government doesn't spend more money than they have. A lot of the oil producing nations in Africa, including Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, because who would have thought Saudi Arabia would be out borrowing money? When you spend your money in advance, based on a hundred dollars a barrel of oil, and that barrel of oil goes down to twenty dollars, but you spend that money based on a hundred income, you never recover. So the economies which are surviving in Africa are those who are not based on oil. Your neighbors in Nigeria, uh, Angola, they are all at a severe cash crunch. So you pray that your economy are not oil dependent. Because if you are oil dependent, then you belong to somebody else. Your own government can't do anything because the price of oil is determined somewhere else. Uh, for those who consume oil, they are very happy. Those who sell the oil, please don't, don't live on it before it comes out of the ground and you sell it. That is risking people's lives and uh, it's a very dangerous affair. So I don't know what you can do. You just have to know how to Co charge to cost for inflation or deflation costs. That's, that's, and that is a difficult thing when you are a startup. I guess there are two points in there. There is the pricing strategy you, you apply because your, your cost is increasing and the role of the government in stabilizing the city. Two things in there. So th those are the two things that I am picking from what he's saying. Um, yes. Um. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Nzongwon from Unibex Solution. Sorry. I have um, one question, but two comments uh, ahead. Um, recently, McKinsey just released uh, Lion on the Move, and they said that uh, African manufacturing output could double by 2015. And most of all, they said Africa need more large companies to power growth. So my question is a matter of uh, or is it psychological or anyhow, uh, to come to the point, entrepreneur versus intrapreneur, uh, to precise, because we are in an entrepreneur summit, so of course you are talking about uh, doing things by our own outside, but how about inside? And um, to come directly, because you said I should uh, direct my question, um, for instance, I, if I'm, I was talking to you, uh, senior lawyer, I forgot your name, but uh, accept my apologize. Okay. Yes. Um, so, remembering what you to told us about your, your story, uh, you, you had a good partner, and I, I understood that as an entrepreneur, things and the right choice, the right people. And, and when I come to you, uh, Mr. Kruby, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, you say it, I almost also heard something like slave versus master. It's a long, it's a long story. So uh, today, me, and then I'm close. Um, I'm much more in an entrepreneur spirit. Uh, I, I work for a company in Europe who want to build his business in Africa. And as an African, I think I'm the right person. But the thing is that I'm almost facing the same issue as an entrepreneur. 
So for any young people who want to come on the business, should we start by learning close to some people like you, which means having a certain entrepreneur uh, spirit, or should we go straight ahead and, 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 and be an entrepreneur and face vers versus, um, uh, like you said, uh, uh, you did it twice, three times, or whatever. So, and keeping in mind the issue with the, business, with the money. So, this is my point: entrepreneur versus intrapreneur at each level of your business. What can you tell me about this uh, about this antagonism? Thank you. Okay. Um, let me, are we, are we clear, with, you're clear with the question? I think um, I'm, I'm going to try and go to the last part of what he said. Um, there's a bit about whether he should go straight and invest to become an entrepreneur or he should understand people like you to be able to, as an entrepreneur, to be able to learn how not to fail or how not to miss the mark. So after that, he can step out and then invest immediately. What time is the right time to go? That's, that's what I'm picking from what he said. Well, I'm not sure I could speak to timing, but I think that you have to have a sense of whether or not you feel you understand a particular business. And if the best way to understand it is by understudying somebody, then obviously that's the way to go. It helps you understand the market, it helps you understand the risk, it helps you understand the type of people you might need to run the business. So all of those things are good. Some people have a good instinct for these things. They can set up on their own. So I'm, I'm not sure that that really answers your question, which I actually wondered was the question of whether or not. Um, I, I, one of my little sort of pet peeves is that I almost feel sometimes like our governments don't recognize that they have internal investors, and that would be people like ourselves. They talk a lot about foreign investment, of forgetting that they are internal investments. So to the lady from Stanbig's point, you know, they are failing us when they allow our currency to devalue because what we have invested is completely lost. You can't hedge when you're a small business. How do you protect yourself? Only by choosing good governments. I don't want to get political, but anyway, that's where I end up. No, I think you're right. There is no one clear rule of the game. Some people are born with ideas. Some people are born entrepreneurs. And others are trained to become one. And working for other people, sometimes it helps you because you are not risking your own investment. And you train under somebody else's risk. If you fail, of course, he fires you. But if you end up wanting to be a, an entrepreneur, then you learn how not to make mistakes while work, working for somebody else. Therefore, when you then start your own business, you are skilled, you have experience, you have references, and you can grow much faster. So any of the two, like you've been working for other people, now you can remove the shock of your slavery and then start your own. I use this uh, yoke of slavery just to give a therapeutic shake up. People to realize that working for yourself is the ultimate goal for many people. But there are people who are born to be employed until they retire. And they retire with their pension. And then they go and live thereafter with their family in a retirement. There are people who are born to be entrepreneurs from the day one. And you, you can't mix the two. Some people who are very good managing directors, like you, for somebody else's business, if you give them their own business, they fail totally. And they can't tell why. But some people need another voice to just keep them urging to do the right thing. Others, their own brain tells them what to do the right thing. So you have to define yourself and find yourself who you are. And when you discover who you are, then life is much easier. 
And that's why I always tell young people, don't measure your own success based on how much the government is doing for you. If we sit and discuss government's performance, we will sit, we'll talk until cows come home. <laughs> there will be no time governments will do everything you want them to do for you. You should ask yourself, what am I doing for myself? How much effort have I put to become independent of government? For me, government can say things to me, I can say no, because I'm totally independent. I don't even go for those government tenders because they are full of complications which I don't need. I can find partners in other businesses and I can do my business without hustle and bustle and being nice to somebody to give me a business. That is not the business I'm in. I'm in business giving my customers more than what they pay for, giving them better than they expect from me. And that's what you must always do. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Can, can we just make an additional sure. point uh, on the issue of entrepreneurship? You, you do know that um, people kind of look at different kinds of entrepreneurs. You know, within a corporate organization, you can have, for example, people who are an entrepreneurial department within the organization. That, that's one type. Um, people speak of the opportunist entrepreneur, somebody who sees an opportunity and does something with it. There's the inventor you know, the, I don't know, Microsoft and Bill Gates kind of thing. The opportunist, I, I think people often give the example of Richard Branson. And then there are people who kind of look for a new product or service and develop it. So there are different categories. Each of them is good in its own way. And it's equally good to sometimes just want to be an employee. Some of us just don't need stress. You know, so be a good employee, earn your <laughs> pension, move on. I, I don't yeah. see anything wrong with that. And live happily ever after. Okay, there's one here, please. Okay. Yep. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Apia, and my question is centered around business continuity. So, particularly to Dr. Bello Saji and then Dr. Chris. Um, Dr. Bello, you've built a business over 30 years and have a, a good brand over that period of time. Uh, Dr. Chris, also several decades, you've built several businesses. And so my question is, uh, when it comes to business continuity, how are you able to build a business that transcends generations? I think whenever you get an idea as a young entrepreneur, it's like a spark. And then within a short time, it's like a matches, a match. You light it, and then within a short time, Africa, most of the time, is three, four, five, six years, and then it fails. So what are some of the critical success factors to look out for, even as young entrepreneurs, as we look to have ideas and develop on those ideas. How can we build a sustainable brand that transcends generations? Thank you. I would have left those, the two questions for uh, Uncle Uso Aichumai and then yourself. Uh, be that you have the lessons from Sikilele and then you, you had also um, mentioned that you were, you were changing your name beyond the business today. So the two of you had mention something which points to sustainability beyond what it is today. So I will leave the question to the two of you. Okay, well, I'll start. Um, I think that I mentioned we tried to structure the business in such a way that we would be able to exit it. That The implication of that is that there must be a succession plan in place. Um, our, the terms of our partnership agreement require us to exit properly at age 65. Um, without telling you how old I am, although you can probably find it on the internet, uh, a decision was taken that we should begin that exit process much earlier so that we had begun the process of handing over to a younger set of partners. We were there, if there were calls, we could join, step in, whatever it was. But there was a very deliberate process of stepping back, stepping out. and. In, in addition, one of the things we sought to do was effectively 
run it like a corporate entity. We're saying, okay, we've earned a salary and bonuses over a number of years. We treat those as dividends. But as we are exiting this business, you, the younger partners, will buy us out. You will continue this business because we need a pension. So everything that one is doing is on the basis that there must be a continuing business in order for us to exit. So we have as much of an interest in who we put behind us to take over as they will do in the future. You know, if you have a flaky partner, you know that maybe your pension won't be paid. It's, it's a concern. So you're very deliberate about how you think about your next generation and the structure that ensures that they will do what they're supposed to do. So for us, that's sort of what we did. Uh, any, any extra thoughts on that? No. What did you say? The, on the um, um, generational handover succession planning, um, beyond what um, business A is today, how do we prepare ourselves adequately to ensure that the next generation can still function it above what it is? Well, my take is that ordinarily you will want to hand over to your son or daughter. But I think we must realize that it's not every son or every daughter who is necessarily business oriented or has entrepreneurial ability. So it might be possible to hand over, yes, to a generation, people who are competent in managing the business and who can push that to the next level but at the same time aware of the fact that the basic uh, ownership of the company belongs to the individual who has established it because he has not gone public, he has not gone to the stock exchange to get the public participation. In that instance, you can, but I always, uh, I've always held the view that somewhere in the background, the older generation must remain a like chairman or something like that to guide them because uh, I think um, the wisdom of the ages experience Kaunda says uh, you cannot buy it from anywhere and so you wrote that, that since he has started the business toil and sweat he'll be more inclined to make sure that he survives and that he leaves a legacy behind uh, so session planning can be very difficult one if you don't have any offspring two if uh, they are not too good but I don't think we should be, we should be sort of cocoon ourselves into a situation whereby we want to really give hand over only to our, our offsprings. I think we should be able to go beyond that. And, uh, and this is what you believe. There are some uh, employees who are more dedicated and keen to the success of the, pro of the program than your own children. In that instance, you should be able to see. So it's a, it's a custom mixture of situation and you have to navigate it in such a way that you don't incur the wrath of your family because they think they have necessarily uh, entitled something from it. But at the same time, also mentioning that those who have invested their heart and soul, their labor and sweat, also benefit. So at the end of the day, you get a win-win situation. And I think it's not the easiest of things, especially in Africa, and especially in the Akan community, as I see it. Let the father pass away, and the brothers are tearing at each other, the sisters are tearing each other, and nothing moves on. And we have to, it's a state of the mind, and the mindset, we must begin to understand. Yes, we, we start, initiate, it goes on, and if it must go on, because Every generation cannot go back and start another project. You build on. Mr. Mercedes and Mr. Benz built on. Toyota, whatever, they build on. They build on to it. It's not a matter of always dismantling and going there. I have been very saddened by Ghanaian companies when the people have passed away, either the Quarums or the Akans or something, and then everything is destroyed. You oh, no, 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 Sorry, uh, point of order. These are things I'm sure many people would know and understand with regards to how it pertains in Ghana. So businesses start based on family lineages and then they fail. How do we stop this? What do we do to truncate the situation? What is the solution? Education, 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 and change of mindset and attitude. We educate ourselves, we change our mindset and attitude, we will be able to live with the situation. 
once we set our mind that whatever you've created, it's not necessarily for your children alone, but for the community, for the society, our common humanity as Ghanaian demanded, I think it will work. But these are platitudes. When you want to ground them, it's a lot more difficult. But as I said, um, I came into business much, much later in life. My job was a technocrat, so I don't know whether Chris has been He's from the one who's a businessman, so maybe Chris, you want to share the experiences of uh, whatever succession plan you've done in this conglomerate of companies and uh, wealth? Thank you. I think, uh, as it has been said by my two colleagues, I can say very little else. You go to have a business that is able to sustain itself beyond yourself. And in doing that, you must look at what services is this business providing. Do you also continue innovating, researching, so that your business is current with the need of the day? Many business will die even before you if there are no research upgrading of the services you are offering. <clears throat> and most family businesses, they die because you use those business just to draw consumption. Very little investment in research and development. And you want to own 100% of nothing. Yet, if you open up and you brought other partners, you can build a big business. But many of us want to own a small bar and you say, I own this pub. You know, you talk to your friends, you say, I own the pub. But the pub you go in has four chairs. <laughs> Why don't you partner with others and build a chain of pubs in all the capital cities of Ghana? And then you say we have a chain of pubs and there are more investors, some of them don't even know each other. And that's why people go to borrow. Money costs money. And you have to pay back. The best thing, you release this business. It's better to own 10% of a very big business than to own 100% of a tiny wee little thing that you don't know, you don't even pay taxes. So you got to think big and say, I am the initiator of this business, but I'm going to open it up to many other people to bring in their money for us to develop the idea. And until you have that frame of mind, of owning something big with many other people. You can own your small business touching eggs with your wife. And then you can say we own a chicken farm. But if you want to own big business, invite other investors into that business. That way also the business has opportunity for you to hire people who are not owners to manage the business for the sake of their management skill which you pay for and therefore that business is timeless doesn't depend on your own life you are your children can own shares in that business without being involved in running it but as soon as you own small business, you are the one with your wife who run it, your children see you growing old, they come and take over from you, they have no clue what made you start this business, they only look for the money from the business to go and buy big new cars. And when you started the business, it was not 
to buy modern cars it was to grow as a business so many families their business die with the death of the founders but the americans their business outlive their life henry ford all those guys johnson and johnson they were all started by small people in their garage mm. but they now are global corporations sure. so what we need is to admire these kind of stories please read a lot of stories about the origins of certain businesses at harvard every day we had four or five cases to do and the next day you have to stand there in front of the class and talk about the investor who invested and what you would have done in certain cases you need to learn how to let it go and to be part of a big cake not part of a small thing sure okay guys yeah thank you um dr bello you, you wanted to add some something to it in response to the question that there is a huge industry nowadays well industry um that advises family businesses on how to transition mm. from family businesses into properly structured businesses where the family has an interest but is not seeking to control the business as you know businesses can be set up for i don't know ego in some cases for social conscious or mostly for money and the, the intention of these advisory businesses is to convince the families that actually they may potentially earn more money by structuring themselves differently. I assume that, you know, Ghana is coming towards that. And for the lawyers in the room, that's a growth industry that you may want to look at. But I think it's something that we need to also think about. The businesses such as Johnson & Johnson, that grew, you know, Mercedes, Benz, BMW, all these huge cars, they grew as Dr. Kiyube said, from very small companies, but they were managed. The huge um, family foundations where they literally have set themselves up as almost corporate structures. They are invested in the family businesses. They don't run them. They treat them as totally separate entities. I mean, so I, 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 I like that. Um, I think that it, it goes to one of the points that um, Uncle Akman had made on education. So, um, and getting the educational bit right. Um, I think there's also the cultural piece and changing the mindset we have. Uh, the third point that I picked out was professionalism, uh, including people who are professionals to help you run the business than just building a family kitty. And again, the last point being understanding that ownership is changing and whether you want to own 100% of zero or you want to own 10% of something. All right. Right. So we're, we're, we're almost getting to the end. We have two more questions to go. Um, so we'll pick one question from you, and then we'll come to the other three. One, two, and then three. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, it's better to own maybe even one percent of something really huge yeah. down to air, own a hundred percent of nothing. But um, everybody who starts a business starts with a certain passion and wants to see a certain future of this business. And um, if you go, for instance, to the stock market and look for investors, and let's say you lose your control over the business, in a business setting, are you not really committing suicide? Are you not murdering your baby, you know? <laughs> by giving that control to somebody else. Let me, let me add another problem to what he said. I mean, we know CEOs who've lost, they've been sacked from their own businesses <laughs> after they're listed, and they have to build again. Um, so the, the micro that should be dangerous. Well, there's a follow-up, uh, uh, in uh, an addendum to what... Uh, okay, uh, that, that's the second question? Yes. Okay, yes. Similar but not the same. Um, the issue of mistrust in partnership. Um, unfortunately, I had um, our first business that we started catering, um, we were so busy working, both myself and my wife, and we didn't have, at a point in time, we weren't going to have time to be monitoring the figures. We employed an accountant to work with a caterer who was, you know, our other partner. 
And then they connived, diverted funds, and you know, it became something else. We even brought in a value, valued the business to pay us a bit, and never happened. It was going to be a long legal tussle. So my wife, for instance, who happened to be a major shareholder in our business now, doesn't want to hear about partnership. Yet, practically, you may need somebody who has the skill and has what it takes. Indeed, for the business that we run now, I'm even grappling with one, whether to let him fully, or how do I structure it? It's something that I'm still thinking about, just to be sure that I don't get it wrong. How do we handle mistrust in partnership? Sure. I, <clears throat> I think, I feel sorry. We've been talking here the whole afternoon. And we have not changed the mindset of two of you. <laughs> let me tell you, you got to let go if you want to grow big. But if you want to be with your wife, the owner of the business, then stay at home and man your business. You hire quality management. Those management even open up, give them shares in the business. Let them be partners because they are sacrificing their life to run a business. But they cannot run business. You pay them little money and you think they will deliver gold to you. I think you must appreciate quality management. Quality management costs money. Some of you are managers, MDs, finance directors. Do you want to tell me you are all thieves? You are not. Shell, Coca-Cola, General Motors, they are run all over the world by management. They are not run by the people who started with their wives in the kitchen. Let me tell you, you got to blame yourself that you don't have the big picture. And therefore, I can advise you one thing. Please, tomorrow, sell your business and get the hell out of it. Because you are not cut for that business, you are busy doing something else, and you cannot cook two pots at the same time. So it's either you have management that you trust, you pay them well, they participate in your ownership, and you have a business you can take to the stock market. You can create a business and you own 10%. And the majority of shareholders can throw you out, by the way, because you no longer own the business alone. Thank you very much. You started the idea. But the fact that you started the idea, when they bought, they gave you a lot of cash. And that is what you wanted to receive. You cannot receive their cash and still feel you are the owner of the business. They are equal owners with you, and you better respect them. Don't talk, I started the business. What the hell, why did you sell? So please, please, if we don't waste our time here, is either you are made to grow a big business, or you are made to work with kiosks. You know kiosks? Right. You are either a kiosk owner and you sit there from morning to night because you put somebody else to run your kiosk, they will steal from you because you don't have a structure of this kiosk. You don't even know how to keep records of your goods in the kiosk. So you have to sit there and watch. It is painful, but you have to decide what kind of business you do. And that's why civil servants can never be business moguls because they have a job to do in government they cannot be running business on the side business is run by pe people who sacrifice their time to run a business or you buy into a big business that's why there is something called stock market in nigeria there is a very vibrant stock market i don't know about in ghana and if it is there please Look for good businesses, well run. You put your money into that business. And thank you. Um, yeah, uh, what Doctor said, I, I have an adage for all of you. He's very right. You get out of here. I mean, uh, if you want to run faster, you run alone. If you want to go further, 
we, we work together. That's what I'm leaving with you. I have to leave. So we have, you have to let it go and grow your business. So your question, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to take the last question um, and then we will um, try and wrap up so we can make time. Um, last question, sir. Yeah, my name is Sam. Um, I'm actually into a partnership with a friend. Um, we're into IT. And then the next business is um, a small footwear business that I've started. And in that footwear business, um, currently I'm putting in so, some structures to actually hold the business and to make it sustainable in the future, in the nearby future. Of course, we do have a growth plan, and that is what I'm actually looking at to guide me into that. But I have friends actually who are all over me saying, Sam, why don't you go on social media, social media, social media to do marketing? And I'm always telling them that, you know, it's not about just going on social media to do marketing, but it's actually about marrying the two and knowing how to manage it by the close of day. So uh, my question is that, am I doing the right thing? Or I should just bump into social media and feel like some others that I've seen failing? Sorry, but I think we have to add another question. I think the most significant thing is that we have stalwarts who are here and they've come to Ghana. At least, uh, Honorable Hackman is here, Nanikia is here, but the Mama and uh, Doc Q uh, Chiribi are not here. Uh, Chiribi are not here. The, I think we have to, with all due respect, ask very potent questions that will transform us as we live here. Because some of the questions we are asking are questions that we can just go online, click, and get the answers. So, for example, how do you come together to build a conglomerate? How do you come together? Because in Ghana, many people don't do it. Two people come together and then they crash. So how do you come together to form a conglomerate? This one goes to anybody. And then to Doc. How are you able to work in different countries with different cultures, with different backgrounds? How are you able to manage that? Because you're not working here with your accountant or your finance manager. But you're comfortable here and you're working there. What have you been able to do to ensure that? Like the, the question itself is very powerful. <laughs> well, for for me, I'm able to be to be here, and my businesses are running all over Africa and the, the world. And therefore, you don't have to be there because you have quality management. You have managers, you have directors who are in sync with you. They have policies, they have targets, they have budgets, and literally they run the business. It's not me. I can be there, but I'm not there. In every day, I'm talking about five, six different businesses attending to some decisions. But otherwise, the routine businesses, they run as normal. And therefore, I don't have to be there. If I didn't want to invest more, I can be on a boat in the Mediterranean. And the business I know will run. Actually, I make more money while in bed sleeping. Because not only I make money, but I regain my life by resting. I don't rest enough. I don't have enough sleep because I'm always thinking what is my next business. So you need a rest, you need to trust other people. And therefore it works. Really, we go back to the central management. What kind of managers do you have? Don't buy cheap. You, you know, you give, you give peanuts, you get what? No, you get monkeys. So, Value the people who work for you. Let them share value with you to run a good business. Be a good employer. That's what you can be. Okay, thank you very, very much. Please put your hands together. Please put your hands together for them. I think it's been a fantastic day. Uh, I'll be handing over to Uncle Iswa Jiman to wrap up. But I think that we've been given all the reasons that we need. The reason to think, the reason to start, the reason to challenge yourself, the reason to find a partner, the reason to build a big business, and the reason to hand over to the next generation. So I'll hand over to you to just give us a closing remark, and then we would go drop the monkeys and build the businesses. 
Thank you very much, Jesse. So a young lady had a dream, a dream that she wanted to actualize. She started last year with the first summit, and this year we have had a second summit. Summit, I understand them to be at the highest level. Yet, she said to have to take the SMEs from the level that they are to the next level. So Yasmin had this dream. I bought into it. Quite a few people have bought into it. And if you see the array of people that I said last year, and what you have here today, I need to tell you that we have all bought into that vision. And that was a dream big, she had dreamed big, and she has actualized it, and thank you very much to her. And all those who have supported her, I'll continue to share in that dream, because when I speak to her, every time I speak to her, I get inspired. Sometimes we have our differences, but I really tell you, I get very inspired, because she's a determined lady, determined to move forward. But I'd like to say that I have benefited quite a bit uh, from this session here, and um, especially when I shared my own uh, story, part of my story, as to how a very big business collapsed. I'm a business of a tenure of about $30 million per annum, collapsed completely. But as Chris said, it collapsed in what? So you start again, and you don't stop there. And the other one also collapsed, you start again. So we have to, we don't give up. I went to a school where the motto is Omnia Vincit Labor. Perseverance conquers all. So if you persevere on your mission, you will succeed. Irrespective of the environment, people survive. And when I was in school, I remember my father, I went to, in Bagro, I went to school and I think I came fifth. And he started beating me. I didn't quite understand. Then I said, he said, wasn't it a human being who came first? So I said, all of us cannot come first. But somebody came first. That means it's doable. So let us be encouraged. And last year, it was another story. This year is how to create wealth. I don't know what the next year Jasmine is going to give us. But whatever it is, if we keep attending, you build a system of um, experiences from very knowledgeable business people who will then um, will help us to take the thing forward. Because you are the building block of what you call the private sector, the private enterprise. Government cannot do most things. Economy is developed by the private sector. And you have to believe in yourself that you can do it. That is the point being underscored here all the time from Tony or Tim Jesse through the two beautiful ladies and my uh, business magnate friend here. So I, I want to urge you on, whatever little you've taken from this session, build upon it. Life is an evolutionary process. Hopefully by said, revolution has one hour, two minutes. You knock off the hour first and it becomes revolution. That is a national cause of things. So I'd like to encourage all of you to um, go over what you have been told, your experience you've been given in your mind, and then see how best you can do this. I have no doubt that Ghanaians can always rise to the occasion when it matters. We've been told many a time that Ghanaians have done very well elsewhere. I was in the United Nations for 20 years, and the best of our best children, including my humble self, were Ghanaians. And so we can do it. Why do we now do that? We are born like eagles, we must fly, we must soar. We are not, we're not, we're not insects to stay on the ground. We must soar. And that, whether we soar, we don't soar, whether we go up, we don't go up, depend upon you, who are the fundamental uh, building stones of our economy. So I'd like you to be, cause you to believe in yourself. Once you've done that, it can be done. Now I'd like to personally thank uh, Dr. Chris Kirubi for coming all the way from San San Francisco Vat Nairobi to come to us here. And uh, uh, my mom, Bala Osaji, who also came in yesterday, and our dynamic young lady, who want to be the first skyscraper in Ghana. And uh, Tony, who is not here today. But the stories are all inspiring, that when you persevere, you can conquer. Just as Yasmin persevered, and he's brought this group of delightful people around, 
and as well as the next year i don't know what she has in in store for us but she's always pulling a rabbit out of the hat so i don't know what she's going to pull up next year i'd like to thank um, all of you here too for coming for me my resolution is that i believe more in myself i believe more in the Ghanaian, and i believe in the um, and management of African bag to bring us yet another delightful array of speakers for the third summit and three summits. The third one is always very special for the third summit next year. And I promise I'll be here, whatever it is, I'll be with you. Thank you all. Have your safe journeys back to wherever you came from. And to our friends from Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana, I say thank you very much, and we will be willing. Um, Keep praying for you and hope that the good Lord takes you safely home to your families and friends. And next time, we hope that you can come. Okay. Sorry? Photo. Yes, me. Please come up. You want, you want her to come here? Yes. Well? <laughs> photo with Yes, me. Yes, please, join, please come up the stage. Yes. So, I end up this way. Thank you very much. and. Uh, Thank you all for cooperating with me to make this a delightful session. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. May I kindly ask all of you to fill up the feedback forms within the folders you have. Please fill it up. Um, there's, there, there's, there, I think there's food at the back. There's food there. Lots of drinks at the back. There's refreshment. Um, so let's interact at the end of the day and let's, uh, let's build mountains. Thank you. MCs are also part of the organizers, so yeah. let's also stand. <laughs> Sexy Chaco, join us. <laughs> so let's spend the next um, the few minutes uh, interacting at the back. Let's have coffee, let's have uh, tea. Please kindly fill up the feedback forms. It's very important. It helps us in putting the program together. It helps us to know exactly what to do next year. Thank you so, so much to all our sponsors, to Unilever, to AGI, to BNFT, to Top, to IVET, Joseph Moore Property, Star Assurance, Stambic Bank. We say a big thank you to each one of you. TEDx, Accra, Somotex, SMS, GH. We are one goal, Nestle, to everyone, so mentioned and unmentioned, we are grateful. Thank you very much. And let's interact.